throughout your journey of home ownership and looking after your property, you are going to be attaching lots of things on the walls, whether it's shelves or mirrors or TVs or whatever. And in order to do that, you need to use specific types of fixings. And people are going to say, well, you need to use this fixing for this type of wall and this fixing for this type of wall, which is all very well. But what if you don't know what your walls are made of? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. How do you work out what your walls are made of so that you know the best type of fixing to use? Hiya folks, welcome back to the show. So over the years on this channel, I've shown you all sorts of different fixings that you can use in different situations. But one of the key things that you really need to know about is what your walls are made of. And there's a few little tricks and tips that I can give you to work out what your walls are made of. And then from that, you'll have a much better idea how to securely fit things such as these really heavy scaffolding board shelves onto a dot and dab wall for example i have fitted literally thousands of shelves and pictures and mirrors and all sorts of really heavy things onto every type of wall you could imagine in customers houses and from that you learn a lot about the different situations that you're going to run into in terms of different wall types specifically in the uk but a lot of this will apply no matter where you are in the world now, I appreciate this is a gross oversimplification of how UK walls are put together, but I really wanted to kind of get it to three different categories of walls, and hopefully from that, that'll cover the vast majority of situations you're likely to run into, but we'll cover some of the other arrangements later on as well. But essentially what we've got here is old walls, so I'm saying 1930s and before, 1950s walls, and 1990 and beyond. You've got to appreciate this has kind of evolved over time, so those dates aren't gonna match up precisely, but just think old, quite old, new. So if you live in an old brick house in the UK, and I'm talking kind of turn of the 20th century, 1900s, 1800s as well, anything up to around 1930. Think of your Victorian terraced houses and things like that. A lot of those aren't going to have cavity walls for a start, so they're going to be solid walls. There'll probably be two leafs of brickwork, so you've got an outer leaf and an inner leaf. By the way, this is what I'm assuming is the inside of your house on this side, outside of the house on this side. But cavity walls did gradually start to get introduced, where you would have a gap between your outer leaf and your inner leaf. One quite common at-a-glance way of telling whether or not you've got a cavity wall is that if you don't, it's quite common to see the brickwork spanning across from the outer leaf to the inner leaf to bond the two walls together. So you might see rows of bricks that are facing that direction rather than that direction. But whether or not you've got a cavity is kind of irrelevant in terms of what you're attaching to the wall because all we're really talking about is this inner face here. And for example, we're in a 1925 property here and we do have a cavity. It's only a 50 mil cavity but it's a cavity nonetheless, which is really good because it means that that can then at a later date be filled up with insulation. But the key thing to remember here is that your inner leaf is almost certainly going to be made of brick. These bricks are very, very hard. Buy yourself an SDS drill. It'll be the best thing you've purchased because you'll finally be able to drill into these bricks with much, much less effort. And these bricks, by the way, generally just have a wet plaster finish over them. So the plaster is applied directly onto the bricks. Sometimes the plaster is very thick, you know, maybe an inch thick, sometimes even more in certain places. But that plaster can also be very soft as well, to the point that on older houses, the mere act of hammering a picture hook into the wall can cause the plaster to just basically fall away from the wall. And no, you can't hammer picture hooks into brick. The other thing you need to remember as well is for your internal partition walls, what are they going to be made of? Well, again, they will very commonly be brick as well. If they're not brick, they're probably going to be lath and plaster stud walls. Then moving on to 1950s, and this is a gross generalization of what the 1950s are when it comes to houses. Cavity walls are pretty much standard now, so we've got that gap between the outer leaf and the inner leaf. But what we're now starting to see is that block work is taking over for bricks. 
on the inside because blocks are much much faster to lay cheaper to produce as well so why bother with expensive bricks on the inner leaf that no one's ever going to see the bricks are now only generally getting used where you're actually going to see them on the outer leaf remember different construction methods evolved at different times in different parts of the uk so this is going to evolve over time you are going to get 1940s properties that might have block walls in them our 1925 property has clinker block walls upstairs this inner leaf of block work in 1950s 1960s commonly getting called breeze blocks and around this time this still had a wet plaster finish applied directly to it but because the walls are much flatter and more consistent the plaster can be a much thinner coat so maybe a centimeter thick if that but the key thing to remember here is that you're probably going to be drilling into concrete block walls you can do that with a normal combi drill would be a little bit easier with an sds drill but combi drill will be absolutely fine in terms of internal partitions as well we've now moved on from lath and plaster thankfully and most internal hollow walls will now be plasterboard over timber stud partitions interesting to note no insulation yet or at least not as standard it certainly wasn't compulsory to have any insulation in the cavity but now most people have had that addressed retrospectively and had insulation pumped into the cavity at a later date and then we get to the 1990s and beyond we've still got our brick outer leaf and then we've got insulation in the cavity the insulation became compulsory from the 1990s and then the inner leaf we would have block work as before but we're now starting to see the introduction of more thermally efficient block work such as thermalite and aircrete blocks but probably the biggest change that's going to affect everyone in properties probably 1980s and older is that now rather than having a wet finish of plaster directly on the block work we're now starting to see the introduction of dot and dab and dot and dab is where you get plasterboard effectively glued on to your inner leaf of block work you end up with a very slight cavity behind the plasterboard because of the thickness of the dabs of adhesive that are used and a good way of remembering how far this comes out is that it's very common to use 25 millimeter metal socket back boxes which means it's going to be 25 millimeters from the surface of the block to the outer surface of your plasterboard so based on that in this example here we've got 12 and a half millimeter plasterboard so you'd have a 12 and a half millimeter gap at the back to get you to your 25 mil which is perfect for a 25 mil metal back box and by the way you wouldn't necessarily use this sort of insulation or even in this kind of way it's the only bit of insulation i had to hand but it's just to illustrate the fact that from 1990s onwards your cavity should be insulated as standard and what we're now seeing in order to hit the more modern requirements for u values and all that sort of thing is in order to achieve those figures we're now getting cavities that are 150 millimeters wide so you'll end up with an arrangement a little bit like that but as i say there's lots of different types of insulation that would get used here depending on the scenario the key thing to remember here 1990s and beyond inner leaf is going to be block work with dot and dab plasterboard over the top and the block work could either be your very lightweight blocks such as your thermalite or it could be your heavier dense concrete blocks similar to what was getting used back in the 1950s there's various reasons why you would want to use either of them but again because of all the more modern insulation requirements it's going to be more and more common that it's only going to be your thermalite type blocks that you're going to see on the inner leaf because you're going to need it to hit the u values other wall types that you're going to commonly see in the uk that aren't quite as common as these three scenarios but you're still absolutely going to run into them stone walls especially in older properties you're going to have solid stone normally a sandstone or something like that but depending on where you are in the uk you can run into all sorts of weird stuff slate flint but let's just generalize on sandstone for now because sandstone's relatively easy to deal with it's much much easier to drill into than brick so again you should be fine with a combi drill sandstone's generally going to have some sort of lime render applied to it on the inner leaf to allow the wall to breathe and generally speaking you're not going to have any form of cavity it's just going to be solid all the way from the outside to the inside 
briefly mentioned clinker block walls. The clinker was kind of a, a byproduct from power stations back in the day. It takes a wall plug quite well, but they're much, much thinner walls. So you need to be careful not to go all the way out the other side, especially if you're using an SDS drill where you can end up blowing the block work out and causing all sorts of damage. We've then got things like timber frame properties, not that common in England, but quite common in Scotland. We've got SIPs, we've got ICF, and all of those need to be dealt with in a slightly different way, but we're getting a little bit niche for this video where the vast majority is covered by these three scenarios. And by the way, if you live in a 1950s, 1960s block of flats that looks a little bit like this, be prepared for the fact that all of your internal walls are likely to be made of solid concrete. It's normally cast in place and then you've just got a facade of brickwork up the outside. So if you live in a block like that, get yourself an SDS drill. It's going to be a nightmare drilling those walls with a combi drill. One thing I forgot to mention as well is that on newer properties you're much more likely to run into metal studs for internal partitions rather than wooden studs. They're the bane of my life because you're never 100% sure whether or not you're drilling into a metal pipe or a metal stud. But here's a very quick general overview of everything that we've just talked about there. If you want to take a quick screen grab of that it might be handy but do bear in mind that the dates are very very approximate. Everything has kind of evolved over time to where we are now. Now all of this can be complicated somewhat when an older property has been renovated because you end up with a bit of a mismatch of everything. So for example here, this was the old outside wall of the house. So we've got dot and dab plasterboard over brickwork. And then over here, this is a new wall, so we've got dot and dab plasterboard over concrete blocks. In the alcoves here, we soundproofed these alcoves, so we've got special plasterboard and all sorts of soundproofing materials. I'll include a link to that video down in the description below if you're interested to know more about that. But again, we've got different materials here where we've got effectively a false stud wall with all the soundproofing materials on top of it. So that's another different way that you'd have to deal with that wall. Here on the chimney breast, we actually dot and dabbed over the original brickwork on this chimney breast, so hence that sounds hollow. And then in the living room, we've got the original brick partition walls. Some of these are load-bearing, some of them aren't load-bearing, but it's just in older properties, it was very common for all of the partition walls to be made out of brick. And you can tell that that's brick because when you knock it, it sounds absolutely solid, it doesn't sound hollow. So that'll be plaster that's been applied wet straight onto the bricks and hence there's no gap or void or anything between the bricks and your outer wall covering, unlike dot and dab where you've got a slight void and it sounds more hollow when you knock on it. So you can see just in this small space that I'm standing in here, we've got five different wall types to think about and all of them need tret in a slightly different way. And one thing that's worth noting as well, back in the days where I was doing a lot of client work and if someone's paying you to hang things on walls, especially very heavy things, you need to be 100% certain that that's not gonna fall down and potentially injure somebody. And what you would often have to do, if you're not entirely sure what the wall's made of, it's better to knock a little hole in the plasterboard and try and look at what the wall's actually made of beneath the plasterboard because it's not always blatantly obvious and I would rather do that and then fill the hole and you know often that would end up getting covered up by whatever you're putting on the wall anyway but I would rather do that and be absolutely 100% of what I'm fixing into rather than just second guessing it. You don't second guess with this sort of stuff. So yeah, a lot of DIYers out there, you'll be terrified at the thought of just knocking a hole in a wall for no good reason. But trust us, that is often your best option just to see what's going on. But if we take this wall as an example, if I was coming in here to do some work for a client and I've got no idea what this wall is made out of, the first thing I'm gonna do is have a look at the outside. All you can see from the outside is that it's rendered. So you don't really know what the outer wall is made of, but it's probably gonna be block work if it's rendered. There's no point wasting money on expensive bricks if you're gonna be rendering over the top of them. And that's why you often see on new build houses, you'll see some walls that are made of brick, and then you'll see a patch of block work in the middle of it. And that block work's probably gonna end up getting rendered. If I just tap the wall, 
you can hear straight away that it sounds hollow. We know this is an external wall, so unless you were dealing with a timber framed property, this is almost certainly going to be dot and dab plaster glued onto some form of block work. And when you tap around, you should occasionally feel solid bits and that's where the dabs of the dot and dab are. I'll hold my microphone next to it as I tap the wall and you'll hear. So here it's a hollow bit but here we've got a dab of plaster behind the wall. So if I move we've got a hollow bit, we've got a solid bit. So this is absolutely dot and dab over some form of block work. And what you're then going to have to work out is what is the block work made of? And really the only way to know that is to drill into the wall and feel with your drill bit how easily the drill bit goes into the wall. This is what's most likely to be hidden behind your plasterboard in a newer property. On the right we've got a 7 Newton concrete block. You can these are really quite heavy and they're absolutely solid. They're great for fixing heavy things into but they're not quite as thermally efficient as a lighter weight aerated concrete blocks and actually did you know you can tell the grade of aerated concrete blocks by how many squiggly lines are going through it. So there's a fun fact for you or at least you can with certain manufacturers but you can tell straight away. I mean this is like dead light and pick that up with one hand no problem at all. This a bit more of a challenge to pick up with one hand. Brickies who work with these all the time pick them up like they're light as a feather but for us mere mortals these are pretty heavy. But let me demonstrate how you know what's behind your plasterboard. Is it concrete block or is it thermalite? So let's drill a six millimeter hole to the depth of the tape in both and I'll show you what the difference is. So we'll go for the concrete block first. I'm going to leave hammer action switched off. Realistically you would have to use hammer action for a wall like that. It'll take you forever. So I'm going to put hammer action on. There we go. Makes a big difference. Hammer action off. Now let's try the lightweight thermalite block. That's it. No hammer action or anything. These blocks are so soft you can tell with a screwdriver what they're made of. You can literally just poke a screwdriver straight into it. You don't need to use a drill on these sort of blocks. So if you find that when you've drilled through the plasterboard and you've reached the block after the little cavity you've got after the plasterboard and you find that the wall is just really, really soft, it's almost certainly thermalite blocks that have been used. And as I say, for most Modern houses, you're going to see this a lot over the concrete blocks because, as I say, these are more thermally efficient and you're struggling now to hit the U-values and things for modern regulations with concrete blocks. And by the way, in this video, I'm not going to get into avoiding pipes and cables in walls and all that sort of thing. I've made a video about how to identify those link in the description below to that one. And by the way, if you do find that most of your internal walls are made of concrete blocks, you don't need an SDS drill. A normal hammer drill is fine for concrete blocks if you just switch the hammer action on. Don't get me wrong, an SDS will go into it much faster. So by comparison, here's a hole drilled with the SDS drill. So it's much, much quicker, much less effort. So an SDS is really, really handy, but you don't need one. A combi drill is fine for walls made of this sort of material. And interestingly, if you've got a really old property and you've got walls made of sandstone, sandstone's 
much softer than concrete blocks. So again, a normal combi drill will be fine unless you're drilling really, really big holes. But for most situations, for most general purpose use, combi drill, fine for concrete blocks, obviously fine for aerated, like thermalite blocks, which you can almost just stick your finger straight into, and generally fine for stone walls as well. Where you're much more likely to run into a problem though is with brick walls. These bricks can be really, really hard to drill into, and if you're finding that you live in, for example, a house built around the 1900s, 1920s in the UK, and if you're trying to drill into the walls to attach pictures or shelves, and you find that no matter what you do, you just can't drill into it. It's because old bricks are unbelievably hard. But interestingly, if you hit a mortar gap, the mortar is often very, very soft. So you've got that kind of really annoying transition between areas where you can't get a fixing at all because you've hit a mortar gap, and then areas where you can't drill into it at all with a normal drill, where you've gone into a brick that's as hard as diamond. So again, think about how old is the property and is it an original wall? So this is the original outer wall of the property. Obviously I'm in the garage here, but when this house was built, garages didn't exist, cars didn't exist. So we know these are the original bricks. I'm not even gonna to attempt to drill into this, but if I was gonna drill into it, I wouldn't be using my combi drill, I would be using an SDS drill. And that's where these really come into their own. They work in a completely different way to a normal hammer action combi drill. I've made a video explaining the difference between the two. Again, I'll link down to that in the description below. But if you live in a property, as I say, around 1900s, 1920s, if it's made of brick, you really want to invest in an SDS drill. You can pick them up really cheap these days, but you will find this will drill into the bricks probably around five times faster than you would drill into it with a normal hammer action combi drill. Now there is another type of wall that you might run into and it's a bit of an unusual one and it can be particularly problematic. I'll come to that in a minute. But another really common wall that you're gonna run into is just a bog standard partition wall. Commonly gets referred to as like a stud wall or a hollow wall. And it's literally made of vertical studs of timber with plasterboard screwed to either side and that makes up your wall. Now we'll talk about what fittings to use in different scenarios in a future video, so don't forget to hit subscribe. But the question you're probably gonna ask is how do you know whether or not it's a hollow wall, like a stud partition wall, or a dot and dab wall? Well, generally a stud partition wall is gonna feel hollow almost everywhere, so as you knock on the wall, the whole wall feels hollow. No part of it feels like I'm knocking on like solid bits of brick. If you find a dot and dab wall and knock all over it and compare it to knocking on a hollow partition wall, you'll know the difference, it's very obvious. The other way to identify it is from the thickness of the wall as well. So here, for example, I know that this wall is only about 100 millimeters thick. Well, for dot and dab, the blocks on their own are gonna be 100 millimeters, and then you're gonna have probably, what, at least 30 mil on either side. So your overall thickness of the wall, if it was dot and dab over block work, it would be coming on for 150, 160 mil thick wall. It just generally wouldn't be used for a partition like this because it's just ridiculously overkill. Having said that, you might see that getting used in a situation where this wall is actually load bearing and it's supporting the weight of floors above, but I know this is a hollow wall because I built it. So we've probably covered most scenarios that you're gonna be commonly running into there, but there is one wall type that we haven't talked about, and generally speaking, it's an absolute nightmare. If you think attaching stuff to thermalite block walls is problematic, wait until you come across this stuff, and it's known as paramount board. Paramount board is literally bits of plasterboard glued onto a cardboard kind of honeycomb mesh, and then plasterboard on the other side. 
So it's really, really thin. It's structurally very difficult to get a good fixing into. If you're in a property and you find the walls are like only, what, 50 mil thick or something like that, it's probably paramount board that's been used. Still gets used sometimes today, believe it or not. And I've seen new builds only 20 years old that are full of paramount board. It's used for cheapness and for quickness. Absolutely awful stuff. Unless you're building a caravan, I really can't see the point in it. I've seen it certainly in 1980s properties. I'm not sure on the exact time ranges of paramount board, but as I say, I've seen it in much, much newer properties as well and it can be really problematic. So for example, if you've got a wall that's been tiled, taking the tiles off can often rip the entire wall to shreds right back to the cardboard. The walls generally aren't very stable. You can like almost push the walls. You know when we talk about new builds with cardboard walls? Well, Paramount board is literally cardboard walls. You can't use your normal selection of fittings because the walls are so thin, you run the danger of going all the way through and out the other side. They're kind of all the bad bits of hollow walls, but without having the benefits of the occasional stud that you can attach stuff into securely. You do occasionally have studs, but nowhere near as many as you would have in a normal hollow wall. Often the studs are made of metal as well, which by the way, I forgot to mention that for hollow walls, especially in newer properties, you might have metal studs rather than wooden studs. So the vertical supports that the plasterboard is held onto. Sometimes they'll be made of metal. So if you drill into your wall and you find you're hitting metal, well, it could be a pipe or it could be a metal stud. <laughs> Who knows? Again, if you want to be 100% certain, make the hole a bit bigger and have a proper look at what you're drilling into. It is not worth the risk of taking the gamble and it turns out you're actually drilling into a pipe rather than a stud. So folks, I think we've covered most wall types that you're likely to run into in UK properties. There are obviously anomalies and exceptions to all of these kind of rules. So for example, over here, I know that it's brick with dot and dab plasterboard over the top along to about here. And then I ended up having to framework this out with some timber and then bring the plasterboard all the way over at this edge so that we could make the wall wide enough to get this radiator onto. So you do always run into exceptions to the rules, but they tend to be fairly few and far between. Do remember that we're gonna talk more about all the different fixings and things that you can use on these different wall types in a future video. So do hit subscribe. For now, folks, as per usual, be nice to one another, look after each other, and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye.